So over the past four weeks, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about rangeland plants. Um, and a couple of weeks ago in class, I think it was the end of February, first part of March, we uh, really started talking about the, um, the morphology of plants. So the different parts of the anatomical structure, um, as well as, you know, what the stems look like, um, the leaves, flowers, um, for all of the different plant groups that can be found on rangeland. So four major plant groups that we're going to be dealing with, again, just as a refresher, are grasses, which tend to have hollow joints, um, or tend to have hollow stems, and their leaves are very, very long and narrow, and they have parallel veins, okay? and they have um, a floret for their uh, flower portion. Um, however, our sedges and our rushes, those are going to be grass-like plants, and instead of having a hollow stem, they're actually going to have a solid stem. And our sedges tend to be triangular in shape, or as the rushes look more like rangeland grasses, but they're solid stemmed. And then our forbs, which you guys can start to see now um, all throughout the Sacramento Valley, um, are going to be our flowers that are our plants that are going to have some sort of flower associated with them. So California is. Uh, really notorious for having some beautiful forbs um, for the next month, hopefully. Hopefully it's a month. Um, and if you guys get a chance to get up to Table Mountain, which I'm hoping to do as a class, uh, I highly, highly recommend it because there's lots of uh, native um, forbs up there that bloom, and it's very, very pretty. All right, and then finally, our shrub group um, are going to be our woody stem plants. Woody stem plants. And they are going to accumulate mass and tissue just like a tree does. So they're going to um, actually create or um, develop growth rings which eat with each new year of um, growth. All right, so now that we've just kind of reviewed some of the morphological standpoints of our rangeland plants, we're going to start, start talking more in-depthly about the physiology associated with those plants. So physiology refers to the function of the plant, okay, so in the activities that it has to go through for that organism to keep living. Okay, so the survival of the plant is dependent on synthesis and storage of food, and this is all part of the photosynthetic process. So just so, to review some basics from Plant Science 101 in your uh, intro to biology classes, um, plants do not get their food um, for their own personal maintenance or growth from the soil. There's raw materials associated with the soil as well as the atmosphere, but plants actually produce their own food. And they're going to do that through photosynthesis. So the photosynthetic process is going to produce sugar, starch, proteins, and a lot of other compounds that are going to help the plant maintain and grow um, for um, the different plant categories that we're, we've been talking about. So our annuals and then our perennials are the two that we're going to really start talking about. So when leaves are removed from the plants, the ability for that plant to actually go through the photosynthesis process is greatly reduced. So one of the things that us as rangeland managers uh, really strives to control is the amount of leaf material associated with a plant. So plants are going to take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and they're going to do this um, by the stomata. And so our stomatas can actually come in many shapes and sizes, depending on what plant you're actually talking about. So for our tomato or our potatoes here on the left-hand side, you can see that we have these stomatas just randomly placed everywhere. However, with corn, which is similar to our um, grasses as far as leaf structure and uh, parallel veins, you can see that the stomatas are very organized. So they're in a they actually occur in a paralyzed or a parallel um, fashion. The photosynthetic process um, is really quite basic, and I'm. 100% hoping that this is not the first time you guys have seen this. So the um, this process really relies on two major reactions, those that occur with light 
and those that occur during the dark phases. So, oops, sorry, let me go back. So as the light reactions um, occur, UV is going to be produced from the sun. That is going to travel to the earth and at the earth's surface, it's going to allow those plants to go through the phosphorylation process. And in this process, we're going to need water that is going to lose hydrogens and be con or converted into um, O2 or oxygen. We're also going to see production of um, ATP as well as NADPH, and those are going to help fuel the dark reactions. Okay, so the dark reactions is the absence of light, pretty intuitive. And during the dark reactions, the plant is going to go through what we call the Calvin-Benson cycle. And this is where carbon dioxide is going to be converted from the reactions that happen during the light period to sugar, our starches, and our fat. So this is just an overview of photosynthesis. Just keep in mind that it takes carbon dioxide, water, and solar energy, plus minerals that are serve as raw substrates in the soil to produce sugar, starches, and fats for the plant to survive and maintain. So in rangeland plants, the photosynthetic process is similar in plants, but it's not identical. So the, the similar part, it has to do with the light reactions. So just keep in mind, PS here stands for photosynthesis. So the light reactions of that photosynthetic process are all the same in all rangeland plants. So they're going to function, they're going to go through the same upregulation pathways, gene expression pathways, etc. during the light reactions. However, the dark reactions is where we see differences take place. And this is really what differentiates um, some of our grasses, specifically our cool seasons from our warm season grasses. So just keep in mind our cool season grasses are actually growing rapidly right now. In California, they come on in November or December. As soon as the soil temperature drops to about 70 degrees or less, and we get a little bit of precipitation for germination to take place. And they're going to, if they're annuals, they're going to end their life cycle around April, May, June here in the valley and um, a little bit later through the mountainous regions. Our warm season grasses really don't take off until that soil temperature gets up above 70 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So we'll see a lot of warm season grasses actually come on in mid-July, August, and September. So the major difference between these two plants have to do with the dark reactions. So um, just keep that in mind as we explore that a little bit more in depth. So our cool season rangeland plants that are currently growing right now are what we call a C3 um, photosynthetic pathway. And you're going to see this type of pathway widespread um, throughout the world. It's pretty common. So a lot of these type of grasses you'll see in uh, not only our grasses, but our shrubs as well. And um, some of these can include the gamble oaks, um, some of the winter grass species in Texas, blue bunch wheatgrass, um, and some of our annuals are going to be annual rye, um, wild oats, and then um, some of our forbs as well. So with these cool season C3 plants, the dark reactions of the photosynthetic process differ because the enzymes in these type of plants have evolved to work best when temperatures are very cool, so during the spring and the fall. Our C4 plants, or our warm season plants that come on in July, August, and September, um, evolved from the C3 pathway. But it was first discovered, and this was first discovered in sugarcane that was actually grown in Hawaii. So this, um, the researchers found that this pathway was present in the warm season um, sugarcane that grew in really warm, humid temperatures. And they isolated this different pathway and then began exploring the rangeland plants that also operated with this pathway. So some of the other species that are warm season grasses um, on the perennial side include blue grama, big blue stem, um, as well as black grama. And these C4 plants have evolved um, with a very specialized enzyme that has a high 
carbon dioxide affinity and um, this enzyme functions in a specialized pathway that, that allows them to be um, very very efficient um, and photosynthesize at higher rates than our um, C3 plants as long as temperature is um, held in check so as long as the temperature is pretty warm so the dark reactions of the photosynthesis enzymes of these C4 plants work best when temperatures are hot, so during the summer. So some of these grasses that we deal with um, as forage crops include sedan, triticale, um, and some of the other hay species as well, timothy, etc. So some of the carbohydrates that occur in plants um, are going to come in two major forms, structural or non-structural. Structural plants cannot be translocated, meaning they can't move. They're going to occur in uh, celluloses, hemicelluloses, and lignin, and they are going to provide structure for the plant. So stem walls um, or the skeleton parts of the plant. Our non-structural carbs can be translocated, which means they can move around the plant, and they are going to be in the form of sucrose, starch, and fructosans. So the, our non-structural carbohydrates provide variation for the nutrient that the plant can provide. So that's why we see some plants that have higher nutrients during um, the maturity season and very low nutrients during the dead or the dormant season because those structural non-structural carbs are actually moving around the plant. All right, so we're going to end this uh, portion of the lecture here, and we'll pick up with the rest of it in the next video.